All right. Uh, Welcome uh, to my talk. I'm not sure how long I should still speak or uh, not, uh, because you're a bit above time. I think at least 20 minutes. OK. Like cool. Uh, so I have a few, uh, let's say, one uh, preamble. In my opinion, uh, digital transformation is one of the big topics of our lifetime. OK. So you might say it competes maybe with climate change or uh, this topic, maybe. But uh, I, I think it will, will affect us strongly, okay, much more strongly than people believe. Uh, I can give you one example, which is not from my main talk, but just an example I saw in the news this year. And uh, this is uh, Zillow, this is like a real estate company in the US. And what they do is uh, basically have a website and on this website you can check the price of houses in the US and the rent and whatnot. What they started doing this year is that they they take their assessment seriously somehow. So, so far they always tell, told you, we believe this house costs that much. This year they started to buy that house. If they believe the price is good, they're gonna buy it just, just for themselves and gonna sell it later on again to other customers. Which changes the real estate market completely, right? Because so far the real estate market is a very synchronous market. You need, need a match, you need a buyer and a seller to want to buy and sell the same house. If those guys come in and do that, then this will completely change the landscape. This is, I think, uh, an extreme example, but it just shows that this profession of real estate agent basically will at least change dramatically. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about trust uh, in the rest of my talk. Uh, and I'm going to talk about blockchain. I was asked to talk about blockchain. I could have talked about something else, but uh, that, that was the, the wish. And uh, you know, I'm going to do that. Uh, and it's a bit related to what Sergey just talked about, I would say. I have a few slides which are similar. For those slides, I'll mostly tell what I see differently from what, what he said, okay? And when I agree with him, and this is in 98% of the cases, you know, I'm not going to say anything. Okay, what's the blockchain? Quickly, I have a very few introduction slides. So basically, the blockchain is a ledger. You have transactions, and you order those transactions. And you make sure that the transaction is there. It will stay there, okay? That's, that's the blockchain. Transactions can be anything. It could be, as I just told, you know, selling a house. Somebody could sell a house to somebody else. That could be a transaction. It could be something like an election. Every vote for somebody is a transaction. And we're just going to memorize all these things in the blockchain. Or it could be, and that's the purpose of this talk, I guess, today, financial transactions. Somebody's giving money to somebody else, so some kind of payments. Uh, well, these transactions, they're going to be accumulated, they're going to put into blocks. That's just, you know, bits, digital information. We're going to aggregate that in a block, and we're going to connect those blocks so that we have kind of a timing information, and that's the blockchain, okay? So very simple. Uh, <clears throat> these blockchains are interesting. Everybody, this is a public blockchain, let's say, for Bitcoin. Everybody can look in those transactions. And for instance, a few weeks ago, I had birthday, and one of my students put a transaction in the blockchain of Bitcoin and congratulated me for my birthday, even in Swiss German. It's going to be staying there forever, so to speak, right? As long as the Bitcoin blockchain uh, lives, uh, you're going to read about my birthday. Okay, blockchains, where are they stored? Where is this information stored? They're basically stored at multiple machines. Uh, that's something Sergey already mentioned. Uh, and they all have exactly the same information. So the idea is if one of those machines is bad, malicious, or crashing, then basically the others still have the information. You can replace the bad machine and you still have the, uh, the information there. There's a few variants, and that's what Sergey said. You have uh, basically permissionless systems like Bitcoin. Everybody can put machines in there. These are networks of tens, and th tens of thousands of computers, maybe. I'm not so sure whether this makes the system more secure, right? That's usually the argument here, that if you have many machines, then you have this data stored everywhere. This makes the system super secure. But this is totally not true because all those machines are running the same software, right? So if you basically have some bad software, then this is not secure at all. So instead, you could have just a few machines and you kind of trust those machines. For instance, you could say, you know, let's take these uh, companies or, or or organizations in Switzerland, and they would organize our digital money, and we trust those five institutes, for instance, and they take sh make sure that the data is correct. Okay? And that's, in some sense, for me, more trustworthy than the model that we have here. 
Do you need a blockchain? Well, the answer is probably no uh, in most cases. I do research in blockchain, but I'm not a firm believer, let's put it this way. Uh, the question is, do you have multiple participants in some sense, companies which don't quite trust each other? Or like in Bitcoin, you have a libertarian idea, you don't trust uh, central banks, and you totally should not trust central banks, in my opinion. Uh, if you have that, then you should uh, you know, look into it. If you trust central banks, if you trust your partner company or so, then not. If you have multiple participants, or if, you, if you don't, you know, uh, if you don't have multiple participants, just use a database, basically, as, as in the old days. If you have multiple participants, and that's maybe only in 10% of the cases, then the question is, are these participants known? If they are known, let's say, multiple companies together, or like just like my picture here, uh, you know, these kind of organizations together, then you can have something like a so-called permissioned blockchain. Uh, where you have a blockchain among those five nodes and they store the data. And only if you want to have a permissionless blockchain, everybody can participate, then you should go here. But that's only for things like Bitcoin. And I would say, generally speaking, you know, uh, libertarian projects, in my opinion. There's a few dimensions you can study. Uh, and I put them down here. Uh, Bitcoin, for instance, is very good in some dimensions. Okay? It's very good in persistently storing the data. It's very good re regarding uh, replication, how many copies you have of the data. It's good in terms of fault tolerance, how, how much you can attack it, how resilient is it, it is to attacks. But it's very bad in these dimensions here. It has this huge energy problem, and in particular for Bitcoin, uh, this is something which will not go away, okay? because Bitcoin you can never change. Uh, there will be so much opposition in changing the protocol, even if you know much better ways to do that, nobody's going to do that. Okay? So Bitcoin has no chance to be changed, in my opinion. Ethereum, on the other hand, for instance, is another cryptocurrency. They have a foundation, it's still active, they're changing the protocol, and they will probably change the protocol. They will get away for, with, with much less energy. But with Bitcoin, uh, I have no hope. So in some sense, I'm not so sure. I'm sure that it's very stable and will be here you know, in 10 years uh, and maybe 20 years, but I'm not so sure that it's actually used because at some point uh, Greta will understand that she has to attack it. And we heard already, and I agree very much with uh, Sergey here, throughput and latency, like how many transactions can you have per second and how you know, long does it take until transactions are confirmed. Huge problems with Bitcoin. As another dimension here, privacy, and that's a bit, uh, you know, a tricky business in my opinion. So for Bitcoin, you have this almost anonymous system, somewhat anonymous system, which is great if you're in the ransom business, right? If you want to get some Bitcoins from somebody because they apparently watched something on their computer, uh, then you do that, right? And you want a very private business. But if you are, let's say, for other kinds of cryptocurrencies, I would rather say you want systems where you basically can figure out who is who or somebody can figure it out needed. So those are the seven dimensions. I'm not going to talk about that more because I think that was well covered. Uh, not seven dimensions, but some other dimensions. I also have this throughput comparison. So this is kind of the max, the peak transactions per seconds they have. So this is Visa at kind of Christmas time shopping, okay? And they get up to that much, they claim. And for the others we have heard, uh, this is uh, more like signal digits. Uh, but, you know, this is not set in stone, right? Apart from Bitcoin, I have no hope for Bitcoin. Nothing will ever happen there. But for all other cryptocurrencies, we can try to make these things better. And that's what we do in our research some, somehow. Okay, so we try to make these dimensions also be exciting to have good systems there. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about two things in the remainder of my talk. That's not unlike Sergei's talk, actually. He talked about layer one and layer two. I'm also going to talk about layer one and layer two. So first I'm going to talk about layer one and then about layer two. So here's the design of a much simpler blockchain. Okay? So Bitcoin is way too complicated in my opinion. Okay? And because it's so complicated, it has all these problems. Okay? So if you design new design uh, that people work on right now. So this is directly from the Bible. Okay? So these are two quotes uh, I took from the original Bitcoin paper, so to speak. Okay? Nakamoto's Bitcoin paper. So Nakamoto, whoever he or she might be, or might have been, uh, had the one thing that it figured out, Nakamoto figured out, 
uh, that people should not double spend. Okay, so that's the main thing. If you have digital payments, if all the money is just bits and bytes, just numbers, then of course it's very easy to give the number to somebody and give the number at the same time to somebody else. Okay, so that's a double spending problem. You spend the same coin twice. So Nakamoto concluded that you need a single history of all the transactions to prevent that. Okay? So because then it's clear if you spend the coin at some point and you later try to spend it again, you double spend it, then it will kind of be seen in this history. So nobody will accept your new coin. That's the basic idea here. So Nakamoto said, I don't want double spending. That's why I need a single order of all the transactions, and that's basically why I need consensus. This is this thing where you have to agree on what transaction is the next transaction. And this makes these systems super slow. However, it turns out this is not true. Okay? So in my opinion, at least, uh, this is not true. It don't, doesn't immediately follow that you need no double spending, you need a single order. And Sergey also said it al already in some way. Just going to say it a bit differently. Okay? Uh, so, uh, I don't know why our talks are scheduled next to each other, but I guess they're related. Okay, so let's quickly talk about it. I'm going to show you how this works. Okay, um, and this is a bit technical. Uh, well, I'm an ETH guy, so uh, so double spending. What does it mean? It means you spend the same money twice. It's like having two checks, and I have here two, these two colored checks. This is from my account, and I spend all my money, let's say, in a Ferrari with this one, and all my money on a Lamborghini with this one. Okay. And I go to the two dealers, I give them my two checks, and I bought both cars, I drive away with them, and that's it. That's what we, what we want to prevent, right? Like with cash money, you want to go to the dealers, give them the money, basically, and then they know that you now bought the car. So in a blockchain, like the Bitcoin blockchain, this is prevented, as I said before, because one transaction will go into a block sometimes, and then if another transaction later on tries to go in another block, and they try to spend the same money, then this is a problem, right? And the nodes in the Bitcoin blockchain will see that and they will not accept this transaction. And as such, they will not accept this block at all. Okay? That's what they do. And with that, they prevent this double spending. Also, if they are in the same block, that would be the same problem. However, if you have something like network outages, it's a huge problem, right? Let's say I go with my transaction to the Ferrari dealer with the orange one. And, you know, uh, the Ferrari dealer takes my transaction, puts it in a block and kind of gives it to the Bitcoin or, gives it to the Bitcoin blockchain, they put it in a block there. But you have somewhat a network outage. So some people see this world and some people might see this world where I go to the Lamborghini dealer and I do that. And that's something I can do with Bitcoin. Okay? That's uh, in some sense a huge problem. Bitcoin just assumes there's never network problems, uh, if you want. Okay? This is simplifying. So for the, for the people in the room which know about this very well, they say, ah, you know, you go there, you make this payment, but the, the dealer doesn't trust you immediately. He wants to see more and more blocks attached to it. And if he sees enough block attached to it, then he trusts you. But there's no hope, really, because if there's a network outage, the dealer might see more and more blocks attached to this and never sees this block, whereas the other dealer sees this kind of chain. And they don't see the other worlds. And sometimes it's a real a big problem for Bitcoin. So kind of asynchrony network outages. So you can do this, and this is one of the su suggestions here. You have a blockchain without this kind of blockchain, essentially. Blockchain without blockchain. So how do we do it? Very simply, okay? So we have, let's say, five organizations. Let's say these are like the Central Bank and FINMA and whatever, UBS, Credit Suisse, I don't know. And if you want to have a transaction, you show them where you have the money from, and you ask for signatures for them. They, they just check that you have the money, OK? And you ask for signatures. Let's say if you get four out of the five signatures, the transaction is valid. You can go with this transaction to any car dealer and say, I want to buy this car, OK? So trivial. Why, why do it more complicated? So now you can try to go to the Ferrari dealer and the Lamborghini dealer and get your five signatures. But these five organizations are very trustworthy. They won't do that, OK? Maybe you get four, I see, you get four uh, signatures for one side and only one for the other side. Then this dealer would never accept your transaction. However, this dealer will accept your transaction. This is my try to forge money in some sense. If I'm unlucky, however, and I send two different payments to those five banks, I might get three signatures for one and two for the other. And then none of them are valid. And then I completely wasted my money. Okay? It's lost forever. It's gone. 
Okay, so never do that. Okay, but that's clear. That's also something you don't do in real life, right? You don't go and say, "Here's my money. Here's some money," and you try to spend the same coin twice. But in this system, it's in principle possible, but you only hurt yourself. Okay, so people won't do it, and that's basically all we need. Okay, that that's all we need. So we don't need any blockchain, anything like that, and that makes it so much simpler in so many level on so many levels that this is in some sense how we should do it. And this is exactly so. Sergey called this a DAG kind of blockchain because you can say you take now money from this account, you move it to this account, for instance, and you kind of combine these things. And it's more parallel, right? There's no single order for all the things. This can be much more concurrent, and as such, you can have a much higher throughput, and you can have a much lower delay for your transaction to go through because you basically give somebody the check and immediately see, ah, it has been signed by those four institutes. It's it's good to go. Okay. It's completely offline in some sense as well. No main chain, no total order. Okay, so that's the layer one. That's how we want the five core nodes to work. Okay, for layer two, I'm going to talk about payment networks, and that's why I can you know shorten my talk a little bit here because he talked about that uh, quite extensively. As I said, layer one is basically a blockchain or something I just showed you with like trusted authorities which kind of look at transactions. However, the transactions they see are not regular transactions. They would never see somebody uh, buy a Ferrari. What you have on top of it is you have a payment network. You have some kind of institutions which send each other signed transactions. This is where the real money flows, okay? If some customer wants to buy something, maybe it's with this bank here, then the money flows through this network to the recipient. And they make sure that in some sense, this is a very safe thing, right? You might say this exists already today, and this is true. To some degree, this is true. However, if we add cryptography on top, nobody can cheat anymore. Okay? If somebody tries to cheat here and do something which is not according to the rules, the other person, the, the business partner in some sense, can always go back to the blockchain, and there's no judge needed or anything like that. The blockchain can look at the evidence in some sense and immediately decide who the money uh, belongs to. Okay? So you get rid of many, many of these legal issues. And we have heard the Lightning Network is up and operable. We have also heard that many of those channels have very little money on it. Basically, there's many, there's not just Lightning. Actually, this is something we invented here in Zurich at ETH. Uh, the duplex micropayment channels. That was the first thing in this uh, domain, the, one of the, the first layer two design. But now we have many, many others, and they're getting better and better. And Lightning was shortly after us, like half a year after us. So we have these channels, and the channels we heard already, uh, this is between two banks or between a customer and a bank. And basically, both of them, in the simplest case, will put some amount of money, some kind of collateral inside the channel, inside like a joint account, if you want. And then they can, you know, let's say Alice put five in and Bob put four in. And that's kind of how much money you have on each side. And then you can move money back and forth between those things, right? So if we, in some sense, say initially we have that much money, then if Alice, this left node, wants to pay three to that node, then maybe it looks like that after that. And so this changes over time who has how much money. It's a bit like, you know, like a toy game where you move money back and forth. This money doesn't have to be... And then you can build networks on top of that, like I showed before, right? You can say you have these channels, so any two of these blobs here, of these two banks, they are kind of connected by such a channel and they move money back and forth. And the Bitcoin network, there's very little money in these channels because, uh, sorry, in the Lightning network for Bitcoin, because people are just trying this right now, right? They kind of experiment with it a little bit. It's not clear that this will always stay like $5 per, per channel, right? This is because the big players maybe are not yet there. Uh, but once maybe we see them, uh, that, that could be interesting. And I would say there's also much better solutions than Lightning, right? I showed you before the list of, uh, of these kind of payment networks, payment channels, and they're getting better and better. And, you know, today you would never implement anything like Lightning anymore. It's just way too complicated. So actually my title was called like this, and, uh, and if I have a few more minutes, I can talk about this in the now. Uh, this is like more, even more technical. Okay, I know it's uh, it's uh, super technical. Uh, all, all ETH people do, 
But what you can do is you can analyze these payment networks. You can check how would you build such a payment network. And there's different ways you can look at this. Uh, one is called here the centralized design. And centralized design is if I'm, let's say, a, a player, okay, if I'm a bank or a financial operator, fintech, and I want now to build a payment network, how should I build it up? What should be the right topology? Which, which nodes should I connect? How much? How should I fund those channels and so on? That's more like this side, like an algorithmic kind of point of view. Or you can also look at it more game theoretically. You can say, if multiple players together have such a network, right, then this is a, a very nice model for today's banking model in some sense, right? Not, maybe not in Switzerland. I think in Switzerland everything goes through six in the middle, sitting in the middle of the, of the banking network. But internationally, of course, uh, it's, it's like having flights, right? You can say, should I have a flight from here to here? Should I have a connection, a banking connection from here to here? Do I make enough money? And then it's more like a game theory question where you would say, which channels should I build up? How should I fund them and whatnot? And we, well, published in this area quite a bit. However, I think I'm not going to give you any details here because why not finish on time when we can, right? Uh, yeah. Let's just go directly here. Uh, so I talked a bit about Bitcoin, blockchain, channel things. And I think my main technical things were how to really build a blockchain uh, 2019 style, so to speak, which is, should be much simpler and much more efficient than what we have at Bitcoin. And I, I'm a strong believer on layer two uh, solutions. They will ultimately be the interesting thing. This is not why we need digital money, by the way. I didn't talk about that at all. We need digital money because of smart contracts, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, that's the main reason why I think people are in this game, right? Otherwise, you can say, well, we already can do things today, as the central bank person said, right? We already can do things today. So that's true. But we can do things in the future which we cannot do today, which are too costly today. All right. That's, uh, that's that.